So speaking of cool shit, uh, Sora, there's like a million questions I could ask. First of all, it's amazing. It truly is amazing on a product level, but also just on a philosophical level. So let me just, a uh, technical slash philosophical ask, what do you think it understands about the world more or less than GPT-4, for example? Like, the world model, when you train on these patches versus language tokens. I think all of these models understand something more about the world model than most of us give them credit for. And because they're also very clear things they just don't understand or don't get right, it's easy to like look at the weaknesses, see through the veil and say, ah, oh, this is just, this is all fake. But it's not all fake. It's just some of it works and some of it doesn't work. Like I remember when I started first watching Sora videos and I would see like a person walk in front of something for a few seconds and occlude it and then walk away and the same thing was still there. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Or there's examples where it like, the underlying physics looks so well represented over uh, you know a lot of steps in a sequence. It's like oh, this is this is like quite impressive. But like fundamentally, these models are just getting better, and that will keep happening. If you look at the trajectory from Dolly one to two to three to Sora, you know there are a lot of people that were dunked on each version, saying it can't do this, it can't do that, and like look at it now. So, well, the thing you just mentioned is kind of with occlusions is basically modeling the physics, the three-dimensional physics of the world sufficiently well to capture those kinds of things. Well. Or like, under, or okay, yeah, maybe you can tell me, in order to deal with occlusions, what does the world model need to? Yeah, so what I would say is it's doing something to deal with occlusions really well. Would I represent that it has like a great underlying 3D model of the world? It's a little bit more of a stretch. But can you get there through just these kinds of two-dimensional training data approaches? Uh, it looks like this approach is going to go surprisingly far. I don't want to speculate too much about what limits it will surmount and which it won't, but... What are some interesting limitations of the system that you've seen? I mean, there's been some fun ones you've posted. There's all kinds of fun. I mean, like, you know, cats sprouting an extra limb at random points in a video. Uh, like, pick what you want, but there's still a lot of problems, a lot of weaknesses. Do you think that's a fundamental flaw of the approach? Or is it just, you know bigger model or better like technical details or better data, more data is going to solve those, uh, the cat sprouting. I would say yes to both. Like, I think there is something about the approach which just seems to feel different from how we think and learn and whatever. And then also I think it'll get better with scale. Like I mentioned, LLMs have tokens, text tokens, and Sora has visual patches. So it converts all visual data, a diverse kinds of visual data, videos and images into patches. Is the training to the degree you can say fully self-supervised or is there some manual labeling going on? Like what's the involvement of humans in all this? I mean, without saying anything specific about the Sora approach, we, we use lots of human data in our work. But not internet scale data. So lots of humans. Lots is a complicated word, Sam. <laughs> I think lots is a fair word in this case. But it doesn't, because to me, lots, like, listen, I'm an introvert, and when I hang out with, like, three people, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Four people, that's a lot. But I suppose you mean more than... More than three people work on labeling the data for these models, yeah. Okay, all right. But fundamentally, there's a lot of self-supervised learning. Because what you mentioned in the technical report is internet scale data. That's another beautiful, it's like poetry. Uh, so it's a lot of data that's not human label. It's like, yeah. it's self-supervised in that way. Yeah. And then the question is how much in, how much data is there on the internet that could be used in this, that uh, is conducive to this kind of self-supervised way. If only we knew the, the details of the self-supervised. Do you, have you, considered opening it up a little more in details? We have. You mean for Sora specifically? Sora specifically, because it's so interesting that, like, can this LL, can the same magic of LLMs now start moving towards visual data? And how, what does that take to do that? I mean, it looks to me like yes, but we have more work to do. Sure. What are the dangers? Why are you concerned about releasing the system? What... Uh, what are some possible dangers of this? 
I mean, frankly speaking, one thing we have to do before releasing the system is is just like get it to work at a level of efficiency that will deliver the scale people are going to want from this. So that I don't want to like downplay that. And there's still a ton, ton of work to do there. But, you know, you can imagine like issues with deep fakes, misinformation. Um, like we try to be a thoughtful company about what we put out into the world. And it doesn't take much thought to think about the ways this can go badly. There's a lot of tough questions here. Uh, you're dealing in a very tough space. Do you think training AI should be or is fair use under copyright law? I think the question behind that question is, do people who create valuable data deserve to have some way that they get compensated for use of it? And that, I think the answer is yes. I don't know yet what the answer is. People have proposed a lot of different things. We've some, tried some different models. But you know, if I'm like an artist, for example, a, I would like to be able to opt out of people generating art in my style. And B, if they do generate art in my style, I'd like to have some economic model associated with that. Yeah, it's that uh, transition from CDs to Napster to Spotify. I have to figure out some kind of model. The model changes, but people have got to get paid. Well, there should be some kind of incentive, if we zoom out even more, for humans to keep doing cool shit. Of everything I worry about, Humans are going to do cool shit, and society is going to find some way to reward it. I, I, that seems pretty hardwired. We want to create. We want to be useful. We want to like achieve status in whatever way. Mm -hmm. That's not going anywhere, I don't think. But the reward might not be monetary, financial. It might be like fame and celebration of other cool. Eh, maybe financial in some other way. Again, I don't think we've seen like the last evolution of how the economic system is going to work. Yeah, but artists and creators are worried. When they see Sora, they're like, holy shit. Sure, artists were also super worried when photography came out. Yeah. And then photography became a new art form, and people made a lot of money taking pictures. And I think things like that will keep happening. People will use the new tools in new ways. If we just look on YouTube or something like this, how much of that will be using Sora like AI generated content, do you think, in the next five years? People talk about like how many jobs they are going to do in five years. And, and the framework that people have is what percentage of current jobs are just going to be totally replaced by some AI doing the job. The way I think about it is not what percent of jobs AI will do, but what percent of tasks will AI do and over what time horizon. So if you think of all of the like five-second tasks in the economy, the five-minute tasks, the five-hour tasks, maybe even the five-day tasks, how many of those can AI do? And... I think that's a way more interesting, impactful, important question than how many jobs AI can do. Because it is a tool that will work at increasing levels of sophistication and over longer and longer time horizons for more and more tasks and let people operate at a higher level of abstraction. So maybe people are way more efficient at the job they do. And at some point, that's not just a quantitative change, but it's a qualitative one too about the kinds of problems you can keep in your head. I think that for videos on YouTube, it'll be the same. Many videos, maybe most of them, will use AI tools in the production, but they'll still be fundamentally driven by a person thinking about it, putting it together, you know, doing parts of it, sort of yeah. directing and running it. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, it's scary, but it's interesting to think about. I tend to believe that humans like to watch other humans or other human -like Humans things. really care about other humans a lot. Yeah. If there's a cooler thing that's more that's better than a human, humans care about that for like two days and then they go back to humans. That seems very deeply wired. <laughs> it's the whole chess thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but no, let's everybody keep playing chess. And let's ignore the elephant in the room that humans are really bad at chess relative to AI systems. We still run races and cars are much faster. I mean, this is, there's like a lot of examples. Yeah, and maybe it'll just be tooling like in the Adobe suite type of way where you can just make videos much easier and all that kind of stuff. Listen, I hate being in front of the camera. If I can figure out a way to not be in front of the camera, I would love it. Unfortunately, it'll take a while. Like that, generating faces, it's, it's getting there, but generating faces in video format is tricky when it's specific people versus generic people.